The World Driving Championship for Formula One cars was established 25 years ago, racing the Grand Prix circuit across the European continent and in North and South America. Such drivers as Fangio, Ascari, Stewart, Clark, and Fittipaldi who carried the title home to places like Argentina, Italy, Great Britain, Brazil, and Austria. One American has won the title. One American in 25 years. His name is Bill Hill. This is his story. America's only champion is brought to you by British Leyland, makers of these world-famous sports cars, Jaguar, MG, and Triumph. And by the makers of Champion Spark Plugs. Champions are number one in Formula One racing. So take a tip from the people who win. Fill her up with Champion. To free himself from the confines of the conventional sedan, man has tried art, surgery, even violence. Now, MGB has a beautiful solution. The world's biggest sunroof, plus a 1798cc engine, front disc brakes, rack and pinion steering. Break out of your mold in MGB, the wide open sports car from British Lakeland. The place is Monza, Italy. These are Grand Prix cars running under the current International Formula One. They're the fastest, most technically advanced racing machines on Earth. The drivers are an elite international squadron competing for the world's driving championship. How's it going? One day, not so long ago, this man, a Californian named Phil Hill, enjoyed unrivaled attention from the Monza throng. At this track, in a moment of bittersweet triumph, he became the Formula One driving champion of the world, the only American ever to win motor racing's most honored title. Now, 14 years later, he has returned to the hectic Grand Prix fraternity, an older but well-remembered alumnus. How are you? Hello, How are you? To see you. Nice to see you, too. Nice How's to see you, Bill. How are you? Very nice to see you. I haven't had a chance to talk to the padrone yet. What is it Derek, Derek. Hello, Hello. How are you, padrone? How are you? Well, I suppose because Monza has figured in so many high points in your career that there must be a very special feeling that you get when you come back here. Well, I do get a peculiar feeling. Uh, there is a strange ambiance here. I don't know whether it's uh, the place itself, the Italian people, or whether it's my personal experience, uh, having virtually begun my Formula One career here and then won the championship here. It's, uh, it's always given me a peculiar feeling to come back. They've done quite a bit to change the circuit. The, we used to use the banking, of course, as part of the circuit, which added another 2.6 miles to it. And uh, the banking now has become so difficult uh, for the modern cars to go around. And also, it's in, not in a good, it needs a lot of repair, that it's not used. Unlike most American racing drivers, Phil Hill's greatest victories came to him in Europe, far away from his home in Santa Monica. His love of cars gave his life purpose from the moment he quit college to become a foreign car mechanic and sometime race driver. The intensity of his involvement, in its way as temperamental and powerful as the automobiles that consumed his interest, qualified him in 1950 for special schooling at the fabled Jaguar Works in Coventry, England. Former Jaguar managing director and competitions manager, Lofty England, remembers. We got along quite well because he, as you will realize, is a chap who really knows a lot about motor cars. And, uh, it is unusual, in fact, I think. There are not very many drivers who are really technically minded or really very good mechanics, but uh, it's been nice to watch Phil, and uh, I've always liked him. I liked his attitude to things. 
Oh. He must have driven an enormous number of miles in races in all sorts of motor cars. Never to my knowledge been involved in any serious accident. Not the sort of chap who went off the road, yet the sort of chap who was capable of winning a 24-hour race, or a short distance race, or a Formula One race, of which there are not a great many. Now there you are, you see. We it's managed right. to find one for you. Just exactly like... Just the right color. Those are the same colors exactly That's that right. mine was. Uh, they called it, wait a minute, they called it black, red and biscuit. Is that That's what right. they call the interior? That's it. You'll find the steering the other side on this one if you'd like to that. drive it. Yeah. This Jaguar XK120 holds special meaning for Phil Hill. It was an identical sister car, one of the first to be built, that brought Phil his first road racing victory. More power, something like that? That's right. This uh, is a beauty. Finally, I think, high lift camshaft, dual exhaust, wire wheels. Can we drive it? Sure you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, this really brings back old I Remember how to do this. Thing. I remember exactly how to do it. Hill knew the XK120 would be unbeatable in California sports car competition. Typical of his intense will to achieve, he managed to acquire the car. I arranged to the company that I worked for in California that uh, I would pick up one of the cars that was part of their uh, very small allotment and that they were going to finish the sale of my MG and I borrowed money from relatives in California and was able to get the car. Managed to get passage through Rolls, got me uh, a place on the Queen Mary and arranged for the car was to go on as personal baggage and uh, in May of 1950 I arrived along with the car in New York, uh, went through customs, drove the car across the United States and I raced it. My first road race win was in that car, and that was at Pebble Beach in November of 1950. So I never did say, I'm going to be a racing driver, or I'm going to be a good racing driver, or I'm going to be one of the best racing drivers. I never even said I'm going to be a racing driver. But the feedback that I got from racing, especially when I first began, my personality needed it so tremendously uh, that I couldn't see anything of the dangers or anything. In other words, I could have just wiped myself out in the first uh, few hours of participation. The, the feedback was so tremendous. I mean, I needed it so much. This, to do it uh, with some degree of success, you know, and right off the bat, I was pretty successful. Uh, whether I had to be successful or whether uh, I... I, th I really am little by little coming to the conclusion that uh, most people can do the, could, could do this job of uh, driving race cars pretty well. It's the, that the, the have to do it aspect, the compulsiveness of it is a much bigger part. Hill's own brand of compulsiveness earned him better and better rides. By 1958, he was an established member of the great Italian team of Ferrari. He won the first of three Sebring victories that year, followed by a win at the Le Mans 24 hour race. Oh, it was just the most fabulous thing that ever happened to win Le Mans. There was something to finish there at all. Uh, 24 hours being a long time. It rained. I, I never did like driving in the rain. Didn't have a lot of experience at it. But uh, I got along very well in the rain. He got along very well, to say the least. During the downpour, he drove flat out, giving him a reputation as a master rain driver that he never lost. His win at Le Mans, plus earlier victories, opened the door to the exclusive world of Formula One competition. His first Grand Prix ride with Ferrari was at Monza in September 1958. Unawed in the company of men like Mike Hawthorne and Sterling Moss, this sports car driver from California led the opening laps, then drove on to finish third. Notice had been served. An intense young American would challenge for the championship of the world. Twisting Apennine mountain roads in northern Italy once served Phil Hill and his Ferrari teammates as a test track for their racing cars. Now they're a path back to his past, 
a path that leads to the legendary fiefdom of Enzo Ferrari at Marinello. Here, Hill spent six years as a team driver, watching the world's fastest racing cars being handcrafted in the vast Ferrari competition shops. Like his escort, engineer Franco Gozzi, the people and place are little changed. The factory itself hasn't changed all that much, but the scientific way that they go about things has just gone way ahead from where it was when I was there. I mean, granted, they were, even at that time, they were supreme as far as engine development and everything was concerned, but they, they were isolationists. They didn't like to look at what the rest of the world was doing in a technical way, especially concerning chassis, and consequently, we're way behind all the time. I mean, it, we won in spite of clumsy, ill-handling chassis. Well, what thrills me is to see the tenacity you understand the year after year after uh, year the, uh, the, of, uh, of progress you know and the yeah. devotion that he has to this concept he is, is uh, I mean the old man is really devoted mm. to this, to this world, yeah know? how many people in this day and age for all intents and purposes give their life like for a cause like yeah. that yeah yeah Ciao. Ciao. Oh, no, 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 uh, have a devotion that sort of goes on year in, year out. And uh, I met a lot of the fellows that used to be on the racing teams, and apparently they get awful tired of that. You know, that coming and going, that unbelievable franticness about having to get somewhere on time and fights with border people and, uh, uh, you know, customs and all that sort of stuff, and then things going wrong and then back home again. And even the enticement of a possible winning a race or something is not sufficient to, for them to want to uh, leave home because I saw large number of them that are just simple. In fact, the whole team, the racing team, is new. And the old guys are sitting at home now and saying that they're very glad to do it. This is the same radio of the... of, the, of most... Uh, very... Uh, uh, Strong doses of technology have altered the Ferrari works. Where Hill and his associates once shook their cars down on open roads, a vast new test track has been built during the intervening years. Fast laps in a 170 mile an hour Ferrari GT car confirm it. The touch is still there. It's the first time Hill has driven a Ferrari on a track in 13 years. It was 1962 when he left the team amidst mutual recriminations between himself and Enzo Ferrari, the Iron Duke whose masterpiece cars he drove. Now, Ferrari is a semi-recluse, shielded from a prying world like an aging monarch. In deference to the visit by his former champion, the proud old man grants a rare audience. Ecco, noi abbiamo qui il vecchio campione. Noi ti salutiamo e ti facciamo tanti, tanti auguri. I suppose that when I met him again, I felt that uh, I was sort of more equipped to deal with uh, oh, the super daddy symbol on a on a more mature level, I guess, because he did represent that to me. He was the sort of super male power in my life. The feeling was really that he had mellowed with age. Well, I'm not so sure that he really has. I think I was probably a large part of that feeling. The memories are inescapable. Hill carried Ferrari's prancing horse emblem to victory in Sweden, Venezuela, Sebring, Le Mans, and Buenos Aires. In 1960, at Monza, he became the first American in 39 years to win a Formula One race. A year later, Hill won Le Mans a second time, the Grand Prix of Belgium, in his third Sebring crown. He was approaching the summit of his racing career. Monza, September 1961, the Grand Prix of Italy. Phil Hill and Ferrari teammate Count Wolfgang von Trips were only one point apart in their battle for the world's championship. A long, hard season had eliminated the other contenders and in the process had frayed nerves, strained friendships. 
Suddenly, on the second lap of the race, Von Tripp's car touched wheels with Jim Clark's Lotus and spun into the crowd. In a shattering second, 15 people, including Von Tripp's, were dead. Hill, in the lead, had no idea of the magnitude of the tragedy. So it's hard enough trying to concentrate on the job at hand in a racing car. When I saw Tripp's car upside down and badly battered, uh, uh, it looked bad, but at the same time, I'd seen any number of uh, accidents where drivers had walked away. Driving impeccably, Hill outdistanced his other rivals. He raced on to an uncontested victory in initial jubilation. Then the gnawing realization that his greatest triumph would always, ironically, be bordered in black. But when I drove in and saw the face of the chief engineer, Keaty, I, I, I knew on an unconscious level then that he, that he was dead. Uh, there is no huge emotional shock because you're, you're unconsciously protected from it. The bang of, of an unexpected death is not there. Phil Hill's world championship victory at Monza began a bizarre decline in his Grand Prix career. Aside from winning Le Mans a third time, 1962 was marred by failure. Hill bore the blame, even though other teams were building faster cars than the Ferrari. Some said the Trips affair had affected his driving. Actually, an internal revolt at Ferrari had demoralized and depleted the team. In 1963, Hill shifted to ATS, a new but underfinanced Italian racing team. Then a final try in 1964 with Cooper, whose cars were badly outclassed. Again, it was Hill who was blamed rather than the slow, ill-handling machine. Yet Hill remained a supremely talented endurance driver, a fact not forgotten by Ford when they entered racing with their GT40 sports cars. By now, he'd tired of the long sojourns on the continent and welcomed the chance to spend more time at home. He helped pioneer the multi-million dollar Detroit effort that would lead to victory at Le Mans in 1966 in 1967, but Hill was not to be a part of the American dominance in endurance racing. The pressures of internal politics in the Ford organization bore heavily. I was beginning to find the same stuff at Ford that I had disliked so thoroughly at Ferrari, and can I just hate that sort of gamesmanship? Uh, I probably could manage it better today than I did then, but at that time I just didn't like that stuff, so uh, Jim Hall made me a good offer and I went there. Texan Jim Hall, ready to challenge the world's finest racing machines in international competition, selected Hill to drive the revolutionary Chaparral. Hill took to the white coupes with ease, running impressively at Le Mans, Daytona, and Sebring, and winning on such difficult tracks as Germany's Nürburgring. Uh, I really enjoyed working for Chaparral uh, in their business-like way of going about things. Uh, minimum of heroics expected, uh, heroics being uh, all well and good and things that you're quite willing to uh, involve yourself in. Yet there's some sense behind the whole operation. It isn't just a bunch of insane scrambling. Back home, he drove the wing chaparrales in the highly competitive Can-Am Challenge, winning at Laguna Seca in Northern California. In 1967, Hill and Mike Spence won an endurance race at Brands Hatch, England. Amidst the post-race jubilation, no one, least of all Phil Hill, realized that it would be his last professional motor race. Quietly, without a precise moment of decision, it was over. I never announced my retirement ever, period, to anyone, before or after I retired. No, we're not getting... I mean, more and more my brain was putting together this whole prospect of living happily without being a racing driver. And I had been working away at it for years without realizing it. I just sort of backed into my retirement. This one's gonna be another story. Yeah. Wait a minute. For any number of years, I had been uh, interested in vintage and antique cars and had been acquiring a small stable of cars. And that was, in a sense, my savings every now and then would sell one and buy another and I was very much involved with reproducing pianos at that time and it was acquiring piano rolls in a nutshell that's how I got where I am now where I'm now uh, involved in the restoration of automobiles 
and I'm in partnership with another fellow, and I'm making my living doing that, basically. Most men fight retirement. Phil Hill seems to revel in it. Now married, with a family and a home, he denied himself as a driver. A new tranquility has descended over him. <laughs> Long known for his quixotic temper, his intensity, and his impatient intelligence, he seems to have found peace with his lifelong love of old musical instruments and classic automobiles. Carburation, uh, the carburation is just like we thought. <laughs> The old cars have gathered at Laguna Seca for a vintage race. Hill has arrived with a 1937 2.9-liter Alfa Romeo, the very same machine he had driven to victory at the nearby Pebble Beach Road Course in 1951. He'll race again pressing the old thoroughbred around the circuit in the crisp, forthright style that is his trademark. He treats the car well because Hill, unlike many racing greats, enjoys automobiles. They are more to him than high-speed ego transporters. He drives hard enough to beat the others at Laguna Seca and to receive a victory lane kiss, not from a race queen, but from his wife, Alma. Somehow, for Phil Hill, a man fulfilled, that's more appropriate. that uh, Nicky Lotta winning the world championship for Ferrari uh, creates a certain kind of uh, special uh, memory from you and Monza on this no, It day. certainly does. I think I was, I was the last uh, uh, Ferrari world champion winner here at Monza, actually, uh, 14 years ago. And it does bring back a lot of memories. There's no question that my involvement with the automobile, especially with the racing side of it, was the only real, genuinely meaningful thing that ever happened to me, or that I ever did. And it had a beginning and a middle and an end that were all different, but at the same time, they were all very closely tied in a way that it, it made me, as a person, I had that feeling within.
America's only champion has been brought to you by British Lady.